Mark chapter one, and uh, I think I'm going to try and do the Mark uh, these Mark videos a little bit differently to the Matthew videos. Uh, I, I find with Matthew, there's just so much in the Gospels, and I was tripping over myself to get through all the material. I think I'm going to try and just focus on kind of a few aspects of each chapter rather than trying to, to uh, cover everything. But let me read uh, the first uh, eight verses. Uh, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with uh, the Holy Spirit. I'll just read the next little section. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Uh, well, in the introductory video, I, I spoke about uh, verse one, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the son of God, and then the Old Testament. Um, but just to focus uh, a few things on this chapter, we get uh, baptism. We get we get John coming and baptizing and pointing forward to the one who would come and saying, verse eight, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you uh, with the Holy Spirit. It's really interesting in, in Mark's gospel uh, that the, the Holy Spirit is not uh, referred to all that frequently. We, we have a reference to him here. We have a reference in, in chapter three when um, Jewish leaders kind of accused Jesus of but, uh, of driving out demons by Beelzebub. And, and Jesus says, you're, you're, you're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. And then you have a reference in chapter 13 when uh, the disciples who throughout the gospel are presented as kind of at best just partially grasping who Jesus is. Uh, but chapter 13, as Jesus kind of looks forward to uh, uh, the future, he envisages them going out and preaching the gospel to the nations and being hauled before governors and kings. And he says, don't worry, the Holy Spirit will give you what is uh, what is to be said. So again, we, we see... Uh, in this beginning of, of uh, uh, Mark's gospel, a sort of anticipation of what will happen in the in the future, uh, even if in the gospel itself we, we don't get much uh, explicit teaching on um, on the Holy Spirit. So we're not, we're not sort of told what does it mean to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. But um, you know, for readers of this gospel uh, who know the subsequent history of the church, they know the importance of the Holy Spirit and uh, His work in uh, the life of the church. So there's that baptism, and then Jesus himself comes and is baptized uh, by John in the Jordan. He comes out of the water, and the heavens are opened, and uh, the Spirit uh, descends on him like a dove. And uh, maybe there's an illusion. We spoke in the introductory video about Mark's illusions. There might be an illusion to Isaiah 64, verse 1. Uh, Isaiah prays, oh, that you would rend the, heaven and come down. rend the heavens and come down. Here the, the heavens are kind of uh, rendered, uh, rendered. Rend, uh, split and uh, the spirit comes down uh, on Jesus and a voice comes from heaven you are my beloved son uh, with you I am well pleased um, that beloved son you know you are, you are my son we, I, again this the kind of there's so much Old Testament allusion here there's an allusion to, to Psalm 2 you know you're my son this king language but the beloved son you are my beloved son. Where does that occur in scripture? It occurs in uh, Genesis uh, 22 when uh, Abraham is called to sacrifice Isaac, his beloved son. So it's pointing to Jesus' death. And that's uh, kind of underlined with, you know, with whom I am well pleased. That's servant language from Isaiah 42. So this idea that, uh, yes, he's the king, but he's also the uh, the, the servant and the, 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 the sacrificial son. Um so there's the, the, the baptism of Jesus, uh, there's the temptation of Jesus. Um, unlike Matthew and Luke, who sort of give us a fa fairly descriptive account of Jesus' interaction with Satan, we don't get that here. We just get that he's in the wilderness uh, being tempted by Satan. And I think the point here is right at the beginning, Mark's showing that Jesus' uh, life was marked by conflict. 
Uh, so right, right from the beginning of his ministry, he's in conflict with Satan, and that conflict is going to continue throughout um, uh, the ministry. And we see kind of conflicts with unclean spirit already in uh, in chapter one. Uh, he comes to Capernaum in verse 21, drives out a, uh, an unclean spirit um, uh, from a, a, a man, uh, and the, the spirit recognizes, you know, if you come to destroy us, I know who you are, the Holy One of God, the spirit, uh, the unclean spirit recognizes that Jesus has come to uh, come into conflict uh, with them. Jesus drives the spirit out, and uh, again, the power of Jesus uh, is uh, st- you know, striking for the people who are there. But it's interesting what they say. Verse 27, uh, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So his conflict with Satan is, is seen as a kind of function of his teaching, his ability to command these spirits uh, to come out. And so that kind of uh, makes us consider his uh, his preaching and teaching, which Mark introduces in one uh, fourteen. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Okay, so again, we've got uh, reference to the gospel of God saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, So here's Jesus announcing the gospel. um, And what, what is the gospel message that Jesus announces? Well, the time is fulfilled. So the time of waiting, the expectation uh, from the Old Testament, that that time of of waiting and expectation has come to an end. Uh, The kingdom of God is at hand. Um, You know, with the presence of Jesus, the king, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. And, uh, you know, throughout uh, the the gospel, we really see the presence of of, uh, the kingdom of God in Jesus as he uh, drives out demons as he uh, heals the sick. That happens uh, throughout uh, even this chapter. There are a number of places where Jesus uh, heals. Uh, the kingdom of God has come. Uh, obviously, though, with um, uh, with Jesus um, ascending and then us waiting for Jesus' return, uh, we can't quite say the kingdom is present in the same way that it was present when uh, Jesus was here. And as you go through the gospel, um, you, you get uh, future references uh, to uh, the kingdom. So when Jesus um, at, the, at the Last Supper, uh, he says that he, uh, you know, I won't drink wine um, until I drink it anew um, in, in the kingdom. So that's sort of suggesting that the kingdom is future. And uh, as we go through the rest of the New Testament, this idea of the kingdom is, is now and not yet. Uh, Jesus has come. Jesus has defeated Satan. Uh, but Satan is still active. Uh, Jesus has secured um, our uh, our kind of healing. Our re- He's secured our resurrection bodies, but we don't have them uh, yet. So that that idea, the, the kingdom is at hand. It's it's present uh, with Jesus, but it is not fully realized. It won't be fully realized until Jesus returns uh, in glory, and uh, and everything will be uh, transformed. But the response to that, the response to the coming of the king and the presence of the kingdom is to repent and uh, believe in uh, in the gospel. And so that's that's in a sense the, the beginning of Jesus ministry. But uh, that's what Mark is is kind of underlining. Uh, I, I'm going to give you the beginning of the gospel. Uh, but the response that uh, is right and proper is that you repent and uh, believe in the gospel. Uh, Jesus, a little bit later uh, in uh, verse 38, as he moves from uh, from time to time, says, you know, we, we need to keep going uh, so that I may preach there and these other times also for that is uh, what I came for. Uh, so Jesus came uh, to, to preach later on uh, in chapter 10, verse 45. He'll say the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he came to give his life as a ransom. So the, the kind of two aspects of the gospel, he came to proclaim the gospel and then he came to to give his life, uh, which is kind of at the heart of the gospel. There's so much uh, in this chapter. I've tried to be disciplined and not go through everything, but just highlight some of these really uh, uh, interesting and important uh, elements. But there are others that we could uh, we could look at. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that with uh, the coming of Jesus, uh, the time was fulfilled. Uh, your kingdom is at hand. We thank you that Jesus came to preach the gospel, but he also came uh, to uh, lay down his life and to secure our forgiveness. And we thank you uh, for uh, Jesus, your beloved son, and uh, we thank you in his name. Amen.